Welcome to the People First Leaders Podcast. My name is Doug Utberg, Marine Corps veteran, founder CEO of ExpensiveUse.com, and I have absolutely nothing to sell you. The purpose of this commercial-free show is to honor the leaders who approach life as go-givers by putting their people and customer value first. Stick around until the end of the show, and we'll reveal how you can be our next guest in about 20 minutes. Let's go. All right, we have Wayne Mullins with us of Ugly Mug Marketing. And uh, what Wayne and I were talking about a little bit in the the pre-show, which we'll get into in the conversation, is a uh, famous quote from David Ogilvy of uh, advertising fame, who said she would rather have an ugly ad that is effective as opposed to a beautiful one that doesn't produce results or something along those lines. But anyway, before we get off topic, Wayne, please introduce yourself for just a minute. Yeah. So my name is Wayne. And as you said, I'm the founder of Ugly Mug Marketing. And our name stems exactly from that quote by David Ogilvy that, you know, in the industry that we live in, that we work in, there is so much pressure to do things for the sake of cool design or for winning awards. And so I wanted us to keep the main thing, the main thing, right? Because particularly if you're talking about advertising and marketing, you know, I'm a very much an amateur in this field, but I know, you know when people do split tests, what the split tests almost always show is that people don't put enough copy in their ads. Yeah, and it, the, the much, classic debate. Nobody wants to put copy in their ads. It wouldn't look pretty, but conversion rates are almost always better when you have more copy. Yeah, I'm so sick of the conversation about long copy versus short copy, right? Long copy almost always wins in split test. Uh-huh. And people don't believe that. They think no one wants to read long copy, but the numbers don't lie. The numbers always tend to reveal the same thing. Well, and th- that's the thing is that statistically, almost nobody's reading the short copy either, you know, because like, you know, especially if you talk direct marketing, your response rates are like 1%, 2%, you know, so if you go from 1% to say 1.5%, that's a 50% increase, but still almost everybody's throwing it away. Yep, absolutely. But anyway, we are like way veering off top. Well, no, we're not really off topic. We're just kind of going out of order. So Uh, But anyway, yeah, so Ugly Mug Marketing, tell me just a little bit about Wayne. How'd you get into what you're doing right now? Sure. So my background is actually uh, sales. I started my career, if you will, in corporate sales, specifically in advertising and marketing sales. And that led me to this point, Doug, where I started out, I was absolutely terrible at sales, but I wanted to get good. So I kept at it. I kept having doors literally slammed in my face. I kept having people tell me, get out of my office. I don't want to see you. But my stubbornness led me down a path to where I actually got good at this thing called selling. And it was as a result of getting good at selling that I noticed this trend. And that trend was as I made more and more revenue for the company I was working Uh for, my pay increased, but the gap kept getting bigger and bigger between my pay and their revenue. Funny how that works. Yeah. That led me to this whole notion of what if I did something for myself? And so I left the corporate sales job, started a lawn and landscape company from scratch, grew that over the course of a three-year period, and actually then put that business up for sale. And within a couple of weeks, I had multiple offers to purchase that company. The question came down to very often when I had that business for those few years was, what are you doing to grow this business? How are you growing your lawn and landscape company so quickly? And the answer was our very unique, very different approach to marketing. Okay. Well, all right. Well, so don't keep us in suspense. What was your very different, unique approach for marketing? You know, you set the hook, so now reel it in. Yeah. So the hook would be simply this, Doug. I think that so often we as leaders, as entrepreneurs, we tend to look around at what everyone else is doing. And then we think, oh, if we did that just a little bit better. So if somebody's running radio, oh, if our radio spot was just a little bit more clever, a little bit more creative, then we will do good. And my whole approach was this. I want to look around at what everyone else is doing and I want to do the opposite of what they're doing. I don't want to be better. I want to be different than everyone else. So, you know, I'll give you just one specific example is instead of us spending a bunch of money on radio ads or television ads, what we would do is we would go buy donuts every Friday, dozens and dozens of donuts. And then we had these custom stickers made that would fit perfectly on the top of the box of donuts. And we would go around to businesses and just drop those off. So in other words, not just any business, but businesses with big lawns that would require a lot of maintenance. 
We wouldn't ask to speak to the owner. We wouldn't ask to speak to the decision maker. We would just say, hey, we were in the area passing out some donuts, saw y'all, wanted to drop in and give you some donuts. What happened over time was that we built an army of evangelists inside all of these businesses so that one day when the owner, when the decision maker walks through the door and they complain because the grass hasn't been cut or the flower beds look terrible, they would say, have y'all seen the lawn person? Like what's going on? And they would say, no, we haven't, but you should maybe give these other people a try. They come by here once a month bringing us goodies. Maybe you should give them a try. That was one of our very core strategies that was very cost effective and built a lot of evangelists for us. Well, because, you know, so my background is in finance, so I'm going to get all math nerdy on a little bit here. So, you know, because I'm thinking about, okay, if you wanted to put an AdWords campaign that was geographically targeted in your area and somebody wanted to say, okay, lawn maintenance, you know, say, you know, business lawn maintenance, how much would that click cost ish? Yeah. It, I mean, it depends, but you would pay a dollar to $3 probably. Yeah, probably dollar. I was thinking, yeah, probably in like the 2 to $6 range. Okay. And how many times are people going to click before they'll give you a call? Probably like four or five. Okay. Well, so now if you think about it, right, I don't know. And what's a dozen donuts cost? About eight bucks, 10 bucks? Yeah. Back then it was probably about 250 to three bucks. Okay. All right. Yeah, exactly. It's, you know, and so basically what you've done is you're essentially at cost parity versus if you wanted to try to do search advertising. The difference is that now you're making impressions, not just with the person, but everybody else in the audience too. So you essentially are getting free advocates with the decision maker impression. Absolutely. We all know that our best customers typically come from word of mouth, right? Your best customers, regardless of the business, regardless of the industry, your best customers come from someone else telling a friend, a colleague, a coworker about you. And yet, so often as marketers, we completely ignore the fact that we can influence those people. We can influence what we would call evangelists, people who are willing to talk about us. Yeah, no, totally, totally. Well, okay. And so I think this is actually a good segue point because in the pre-show you were talking about when you were developing in your business, you started out really feeling that you didn't have what it takes to be a good leader or to be a people first leader. And I'd like to talk about how that evolved over time because I feel that it's going to be pretty similar to how your sales skills evolve, which in my experience is that you decide you're going to get better at it and you just basically keep psychologically injuring yourself until you improve. You're spot on, Doug. I mean, that is my exact story. So for the first probably six or seven years of owning this agency, my core belief was that I'm not a good leader. I'm not a good manager of people. Like I despised anything that had to do with attempting to lead and manage people because I didn't view myself as a leader or manager. I viewed myself as a great marketer. Like people weren't my thing. I mean, that's just the reality. They weren't my thing. And the moment for me that brought me to this realization that things could possibly be different was I went to this luncheon for entrepreneurs and it's all business owners in the room. And the day that I happened to go to this particular meeting, the topic was employees and your team. And so as I'm sitting in this room and at the very beginning, people are introducing themselves. And the question was, you know, introduce yourself, your business and how many people work for you. So we're going around the room and all eyes are on this one entrepreneur who's by far the biggest business and most quote unquote successful in the room who has a lot of employees. So it gets to him, he introduces himself, says his name, says his company. And then he says, as in terms of how many employees I have working for me, it's about half of them. And so, you know, it's the old joke. How many people you have working for it? Yeah, I'd say about half. <laughs> yeah. Everybody breaks out laughing. And for the next hour and a half, the entire conversation in that room full of business owners, some of them literally dozens and dozens of years in business. The gentleman who made that joke had about 600 employees at the time. And for the next hour and a half, it was nothing but a complaint fest about all the employee issues, all the problems, how no one wants to work, how you know, it's just these horror stories after horror stories. I left that meeting and said, look, if this is the reality of business, I don't want anything to do with business. But I said, I know that it's not because I know there's so many other companies out there in the world who have amazing teams, who have an amazing culture, who not just them as the owner want to get up and go to work every day, but the team, 
actually wants to come to work every day. And that was the pivot moment for me. Yeah. Well, and because I think keying on this, one of the things that I think about frequently is that with possibly a couple exceptions, I mean, there are psychopaths out in the world. There's not as many as most people think, but almost nobody starts a company with the thought, hey, I want to have a toxic culture here. I want people to despise every moment that they're here. Yet a disturbing number of companies end up there. So he said, nobody wants to end up there, but almost everybody does end up there. So that means there is some common set of decisions, actions, or whatever that most people are taking that are taking them down that path. And so I think that this is where it's really important to say, okay, what are those? Because that's going to help you unlock that how do you get to that place where people do want to come? And not everybody's going to want to show, going to be you know, like enlivened to show up every single day. And to, you're not going to get 110% out of every person you hire every day all the time. But the numbers don't need to skew as high as you might think in order for you to have a fantastically successful company. No, I agree. I think for me, my journey is exactly that. I didn't want a terrible toxic culture, but that is what I had. Okay. And what I've learned is that if you are not intentional about building the culture you want, then you are unintentionally building the culture you don't want. And it starts with this whole notion. So for me, growing in my business and developing my business, for so long I kept thinking, culture is this thing that I will get to one day. I don't have the money for the ping pong tables. I don't have the money for the snack bars. I don't have the money for the napping pods like Google and all these other companies. Like one day, when we're successful, None of that stuff matters. From my mentality at that time, that's what I was equating to success and a positive culture because Google at the time was the best place to work in the world. And that's all the things that they had for their people, right? But what I've come to discover is that culture comes from the same word as to cultivate. And so when we think about cultivating soil, right, that's what farmers have to do. One, they have to cultivate it before they can even plant the seeds in the soil. They have to break up the hard soil. They have to make sure that it's fertile soil. They have to add nutrients. They have to ensure that the soil is ready for the seed. And then once the seed is there, you still have to cultivate the soil. You have to remove the weeds. You have to ensure the right nutrients are there. You have to ensure that it's getting the right amount of water, not too much water, right? And so for me, this idea of culture became this notion that Culture is a constant part of my focus as a leader and that my intentions must be set around building the culture that I do want. Outstanding. I love it. So kind of walk me through, how did you do that? Because I think the thing that a lot of people run into is that intuitively everybody says, hey, I want to build that positive culture. And you know, within every, you know, I'm going to laugh when I say this, within every 12 hour, eight hour workday, there are 27 hours worth of work that needs to be done. So it's a matter of, okay, in a, in a bucket that's already, you know, overflowing, how do you find space to manage and to cultivate a culture? Sure. What I would say is that number one, define the culture you want, right? The culture that we have, it's a fabulous, great culture, but there's a lot of other cultures that are great that look and feel a lot different than the one we have. So you have to define what you want. And I can tell you for me, one of the things that I wanted was I wanted a team that could execute without my constant involvement and attention. That's what I wanted. But where I saw myself and where I see so many entrepreneurs and leaders getting tripped up is this. They have conditioned their team that they are the answering machine. In other words, every time a problem comes up, every time there's a question about something, mm -hmm. the leader, the manager, the entrepreneur has conditioned the team to come to them for those answers. So for me, what I had to do is I had to put a sticky note on my computer at my desk that said, ask, don't answer. Ask, don't answer. So every time somebody came to me with a question, hey, Wayne, we've got this customer who's upset about this thing, or you know, we've got this potential for this project over here. What do you think we should do to pursue it? I would remind myself, do not give them the answer, which giving the answer is easy, right? We as leaders, as managers, as owners, it's easy for us to rattle off, oh, here's the three things to go do, or here's exactly how to handle that customer's complaint. Instead, I had to learn to take the patience to say, hey, that's a wonderful question. What do you think we should do in this situation? So it then forces them to think, huh, 
I don't know. What should we do? So they've got to process through. And it requires a lot of patience, but it requires you learning to not have to be the hero in every single decision. Well, and so relate, not quite exact to that, but related. This resonates with me because I know probably the, one of the biggest cognitive demons I've had to overcome just myself is that I spent a lot of my youth feeling like I always had to be the smartest person in the room. Because, you know, I can say I was a pretty studious fellow. I was a curious guy, good grades, blah, 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 blah. And so, you know, I thought I was pretty smart. And, but the problem is that if you're the smartest person in the room, you're not learning. And so then even if you are the smartest person in the room, then you can't learn anything from anybody. But if you will just let yourself not be the smartest person in the room, then you can learn something from every interaction. And that was kind of the thought that I had from there because I'm like, okay, yeah, the, I thought I learned a whole lot more when I didn't feel like I had to sh try to show that I was smarter than everybody I interacted with. Yeah. So my experience in my business is no different than probably a lot of people listening, a lot of leaders listening to this, managers listening to this. And it's this notion that if I'm not involved, if I'm not overseeing, if I'm not constantly there, things are going to fall apart. It, it's to the point now where in my agency, we at any point in time have well over 100 active clients that we're working with. And I work with none of them. I don't go to meetings with them. I don't show up for them. I, you know, I work internally with our team, answering questions from time to time and helping come up with strategies. But I've made it so that my team, they're the experts. It's not Wayne. It's not the Wayne show, right? If this is the team, I want them to be experts in their areas. I want them to become leaders within their chosen field, within their chosen area or, or type of business. Yes. And I think that's really important because if you have a business that is the Wayne show, or in my case, the Doug show, that business is unsellable until the point where it can run without having everything go through a single person. Yeah. But again, we often are our own worst enemies, right? We do that to ourselves because we hold a belief that is, if I'm not involved, if I'm not giving the answers, then they're going to screw up. Then they're going to make mistakes. Then things are going to fall apart. And that is not simply true. That is just not true, right? I held that belief. I believed that to be true for so long until I decided that it was no longer going to be true. Yeah. Right. I had to set that intention. That was no longer going to be true, that I was going to build a team that was trustworthy. I was going to build a team that could execute without me. And here's the most interesting part of that, Doug. The team that I had then that I didn't trust, that I didn't believe could execute without my constant involvement is the same team I have today. And I totally believe that because there's something really important you just said that just struck a chord with me, which is that Basically, what you did was you said, hey, I want to make a trusting team and I'm going to turn that, that is going to now become my top priority. And that's like, you know, how do you turn your team around? That's how you do it. Trusting team, that is now my top priority and everything else works around that. You just, you know, what you do is you figure out what that one thing is. That's your top priority. Everything else moves around it. And then stuff will turn pretty quickly. If something's your number one priority, usually that tends to get done. Yeah. We now lead with trust. So. By nature, by default, I would say I'm probably like a lot of people where my default is probably not trust. It's more suspicion. But one of the very first conversations we have with people when they join our team is this, that we are a company who leads with trust. And so whether you give your word, actually speaking your word, in other words, when you say you're going to do something, you verbalize it, or whether that's implied, right? Just by the fact you have a job here, there are certain implied things that you've committed to, right? Showing up to work when you're supposed to show up to work, showing up for meetings when you're supposed to show up for meetings. Like we don't have to tell you every time. You don't have to say, I'm going to be there. It's implied that you're going to be there. You've given your word through that implication. So we tell them like when you're here, when you give your word, you have the ability to maintain the trust that we're imparting to you or to erode that trust and start building suspicion. But every time you give your word, whether explicit or implicit, implied, you're building either more trust 
or you're eroding that trust and starting to build suspicion? I think that kind of thing is really important to internalize because it's like we were talking about earlier in the conversation, right? Nobody goes off the rails on purpose. And so the way that you end up with a low trust culture isn't because that's what you were trying to do. It's because you got more focused on something besides having a trust first culture and you just sort of end up backstepping into there. You said it earlier in terms of it's our beliefs though, right? It's what we choose to believe. I can choose to believe every morning that the people who work for me are going to show up and intentionally try to screw things up. I could choose to believe that. And honestly, a long time, I believed that people on my team were lazy. I believed that they were going to always take the shortcut. I believed those things. When I shifted my belief, the whole culture changed. And I find that with leadership in general, the most difficult person that you or I will ever have to lead is the person who looks back at us in the mirror every single morning. And so if I can give that person grace, which we're all great at giving ourselves grace, you know, Doug, I I think it's interesting. We judge ourselves. I've had to get better at it myself. (laughs) Yeah, but we judge ourselves based on our intentions. So I intended to go work out this morning but I had a terrible night's sleep. Therefore, it's not that big of a deal because you know I had a terrible night's sleep, so I give myself a pass. But we judge other people based on their actions. So we judge ourselves based on our attention. We judge others based on their actions. So when we remind ourselves of that, we always have to remember there's more to the story that took place. So someone shows up late for a meeting. In that moment, I can decide what I'm going to choose to believe. I can choose to believe that they're lazy or they're forgetful or they just don't care. Or I could say, you know what? There's probably more to the story. I'm judging them based on one action. Were they on time to the meeting or were they not? I'm not judging them based on the intention and the fact that they intended to be here. They would have been here, but their kid was sick this morning throwing up. Yeah. So I think it's important for us as leaders to remember that. I don't know that there's anything I can add to it, so I'll try to. Well, Wayne, this has been a lot of fun. Give us your last few thoughts. I mean, I think I'm a fan of ending on a high point and I feel like you just made one. So yeah, give us your last few thoughts and let everybody know where they can find out more about Wayne and learn more about uh, Ugly Mug Marketing. Absolutely, Doug. So two final thoughts is this. Number one, I would say, win furious, get curious. So often in our businesses, in our lives, something will trigger us, right? We'll get triggered. We'll get furious in the moment. And instead of turning that, that initial reaction of furiousness, if that's a word, our initial you know, thoughts of being furious, if we turn that into curious, so the person didn't show up to the meeting, I'm furious because they didn't show up. Instead, let's turn that into curiosity. Hey, just curious. I noticed you didn't show up. Did something happen? Did something take place? You know, and there's usually way more to the story than our initial reaction would have us believe. So that's number one, when furious get curious. Number two is this, that consistency creates miracles. Consistency creates miracles. That is true in every aspect of our life, from our personal relationships, to our physical health, to the way we show up and the way we lead other people. Okay, excellent. And Wayne, your links, where should people go to find you? The simplest place, Doug, is just UglyMugMarketing.com. All of our social media, all of our phone numbers, email addresses are all right there. Beautiful. UglyMugMarketing.com. Wayne, great talking with you today. Thanks so much, Doug. I've enjoyed our chat. Me too. Thank you so much for listening to the People First Leaders podcast. If you are a successful People First founder or CEO who would like to be on this show, please visit PeopleFirstLeaders.net forward slash guest. If this interview resonated, would you please share it on social media? Just take a quick screenshot on your phone and post it on your favorite social channel. Then make sure to tag me at Doug Value so I can give you and your business a shout out on a future episode. If you know somebody who'd be a great guest, please tag them on social and include the hashtag PeopleFirstLeaders. I really love seeing your posts and guest suggestions. We're releasing new content and episodes all the time. So make sure to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any new episodes. Your thumbs up, ratings, and reviews go a long way to help promote the show, and they mean a lot to me personally. And also, I would like to connect with you on social. 
My handle is at Doug Value, or you can just go to peoplefirstleaders.net where all of the links are posted. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time.